Energy is a major driver of expansion. So the availability of what is effectively an enormous energy subsidy, a huge energy inheritance that we simply discovered, the effect of that has been to enable an enormous period of expansion. And with expansion comes the development of extremely complex societies. So energy has been a major driver of socioeconomic complexity, social differentiation, the building of hierarchies. All of that has been enabled by energy. But energy, I would argue, is not going to be the cause of what, what the financial crisis that we're going to go through now. It's been an enabler of complexity, and finance is part of that, but you don't have to have a massive energy subsidy to blow a bubble. Bubbles have existed from all the way back to antiquity and, and beyond. I've written about a number of historical bubbles that came long before the fossil fuel era. So although energy increases the odds of blowing a bubble, it's not actually necessary for blowing a bubble, and it's not a lack of energy that makes a bubble burst. So if we look at the 1930s, the Depression, the Great Depression, in America, people said, well, we have everything except money. They were the global swing producer for oil. They had a virgin continent's worth of resources. They had cheap labor everywhere. So it wasn't a lack of resources that caused the Depression. And it won't be a lack of resources that caused the Depression this time either because the impact of financial crisis is so quick that finance will be the key driver to the downside. Further on, that will cause a substantial supply contraction for oil, but it's more a question that financial crisis will drive energy crisis than the other way around. Marion King Hubbard was an American geologist in the 1950s, he predicted that American oil specifically, would, oil production would peak in the early 1970s. They laughed at him at the time, but he was right. That was when American oil peaked. He predicted at the same time that global oil production would peak in the early years of the new millennium, which it appears to have done. So he was incredibly prescient. He was very far-sighted about what was going to happen with oil supply. So I think he's been completely vindicated in his model and his, his approach to understanding production peaks. So peak oil is a production peak. It doesn't mean that there's no oil left. What it means is that you can no longer increase production from one year to the next. And this is, this is very important. There could be half the oil that ever existed still under the ground. But if we can't get at it, if we can't keep increasing production, then we have a problem. And part of the reason that we can't keep increasing production is net energy. So in the early days of the oil industry, if you invested one unit of energy in energy production, you would get 100 units in return in the 1930s, for instance, in America or later in Saudi Arabia. Now we have fallen probably to something like 10 to 1 globally. That means the energy that we have as a surplus for society's purposes is much less. So more and more of the energy we produce has to be put back into energy production because instead of being able to stick a straw in the ground and wait for a gusher with very little effort, now we're working in the deep offshore, maybe the Arctic, challenging environments. Even in places like Saudi Arabia, where it was once very simple to produce oil, now they're involved in a lot of very complex tertiary recovery techniques, water flooding, all sorts of very expensive, energy-intensive means of recovering what oil is left. So that means more of what they produce goes back into production. The surplus, which is what, the, what society lives on, is much smaller. So if you look at the decline in oil supply in gross terms,
the decline is not so rapid. If you look at it in net energy terms, it's like falling off a cliff because the amount of energy that you have to put back into the system is growing enormously. So the surplus shrinks very rapidly. So it's not just a production peak, it's a net energy cliff that we're facing. And all of the alternatives to energy, or to fossil fuels, typically have lower net energy than, than fossil fuels do. So the surplus is even smaller. People talk about converting to a, a renewable energy economy and putting solar panels on the roofs. And, and they say, as oil gets more expensive, renewable energy will be affordable. The problem is, we don't make solar panels with solar power or wind turbines with wind power. As the price of oil goes up, the price of renewable energy goes up even more and it stays just out of reach. This is a concept called receding horizons. So we have a major problem with net energy for renewables. We have a major problem with fossil fuel dependency for building the infrastructure. And we also have a problem that our societies are built on concentrated demand. Renewable energy is diffuse. It's not all in one place like a big power plant. It's spread out. That means the requirement for power grid infrastructure is much higher. That means the net energy of energy production from renewables is lower because you have to account for the, the energy cost of building energy transport infrastructure. So it's far more complicated than most people think. You also have to include the fact that renewable energy delivers intermittent power, not all renewable energy, hydro doesn't, and biogas doesn't, but solar and wind deliver intermittent power. You can't run a power system on intermittent power sources because you have no ability to control power system parameters like frequency and voltage. The intermittent sources assume the parameters are established by something else. They can't establish the parameters themselves. So you have a, an upper limit for intermittent sources beyond which you cannot control a power system. So there are lots of issues to do with power system engineering and control that are not well understood by people who think we will have a renewable energy future. We could, we could do it in some ways by simply producing the energy where we use it. Put a solar panel on your roof and use it in your own house. That's good for you, but it doesn't run society. It doesn't give you factories. It doesn't run cities. So the only way to use renewable energy that takes away the grid dependency is to use it in place. But because our demand is concentrated, that's hard. How do we get from here to a distributed, decentralized future? That's where renewable energy would suggest we have to go, but we're not there now. So we have a huge transition to make in terms of how our societies are structured. Right now, we depend on the central station model for large thermal power plants to deliver concentrated sources of power to concentrations of demand. So it's a very complex picture of peak oil and it interacts with finance, of course, and time frames in very complex ways as well. I've written about shale gas. It's an enormous pyramid scheme, an enormous Ponzi scheme. The net energy is really low. It takes a lot of energy put in to get energy out. You have to fracture the rocks that contain the gas. That causes also horrible environmental problems. But just looking at it in energy terms and financial terms, the net energy is much lower than conventional natural gas. So it's not an equivalent. Yes, there is a lot of gas trapped in the rock, but because the net energy is very low, it's going to be extremely difficult to get at it. So how much is in the rock is irrelevant. What matters is what can we get. And there, effectively, there's a lower limit for net energy that defines what is an energy source. People understand that if you put one unit in and get one unit out, that would be pointless.
But the limit is actually higher than that because you have to have enough of a surplus to, to run the society structures as they exist. So for any given society, there's going to be a minimum net energy to define something as an energy source. Shale gas is far below that minimum. In North America, conventional natural gas production peaked in 2001. Shale gas has come along since then as kind of the great white hope, if you like. People are thinking there's an enormous amount of it. So they've all gone back to sleep again about worrying about gas supply. But what they're going to find is conventional gas production can collapse very quickly. Shale gas will not replace it, not even close. If you, if you look at what happens with shale gas provinces, in fact, there are only some areas where there's gas that you can really get at. So you might see a large formation, but only some areas are worth producing. So you have to drill a lot of dry wells. That, of course, is a huge waste of, of energy. That's one of the reasons the net energy is, is very low. And the amount of gas you can produce is actually relatively few years of supply from shale mm -hmm. gas. But what has happened, because there's the perception that there's a huge amount of gas out there, it has crashed natural gas prices. So right now, the shale gas producers are operating at a loss because the price of gas has fallen below the cost of producing shale gas. So all of them are operating in economically marginal conditions, so they could go out of business. This is going to be a major problem. To, and, and, but the, the interesting fact about shale gas as well, that there's actually nothing to do with gas, is because there was a perception that shale gas was going to be so valuable, the land leases were worth an enormous amount of money. So a lot of the shale gas bubble has been about land lease speculation. So the, the amount of money you can make on claiming, on staking a claim to a piece of land and then selling it later for 10 times as much money, the amount of money you make on land lease speculation is vastly more than you make on the gas. But at some point when people realize that actually the whole industry is a mirage, the price of land leases will crash. It's just yet another land bubble, another property bubble. So it's, it's about energy, but it's also about speculation and real estate bubbles, which is exactly what has got us into trouble in so many other ways. I did biology uh, originally, and my focus was partly environmental science, but a major focus when I was a biologist was psychology and neuroscience, understanding how people work. And it's interesting that it's not enough to understand how an individual works. We need to understand what happens when you get a whole lot of individuals together. What you get are emergent properties as a function of scale. So even if you understand everything there is to know about a human being, it doesn't tell you what happens when you get a crowd of them together. So there is a whole new set of properties that emerge as a function of grouping individuals together. So collective psychology is an incredibly important study. And one thing that people don't realize is just how much people perceive absorb and reflect the emotions of others. Emotions are unbelievably catching. Euphoria, fear, anger. We don't even realize we're doing it. I mean, we think that only lower man mammals uh, have warning systems like that. Um, deer that flash the white underside of their tail and all the other deer run away or beavers that flap their tail on the water as a danger signal and all the other beavers dive in the water. We do the exact same thing. We, we have an inbuilt herding behavior kind of mechanism at a collective level. So when you are building a bubble and expanding, people catch the euphoria of others. They catch the, the, the wave, if you like. So they, they don't worry about risk, 
they only look at reward, there's hope, there's greed, and there's a sense that, that we can do anything. So we'll just put our money into this, there's no risk. That's what really builds a bubble where people don't care what they pay for something because they think someone else will always pay more later. It's very much a collective approach. But when you run out of the supply of greater fools, where there's nobody who will pay any more, then the whole system goes into reverse. So instead of the spread of euphoria, you have the spread of fear. The virtuous circle that led to expansion becomes a vicious circle that leads to contraction. Fear spreads, prices fall, people sell, so more prices fall more and more people sell. And you get financial contagion, which is simply the spread of fear. But people are not behaving rationally when they do this. They're behaving emotionally. They're catching the emotions of others and reflecting them and acting on them. What they do is they rationalize their behavior. So they behave because of the emotional driver and then they come up with a story in their own mind for why they just did what they did. So we are not a rational species, we are a rationalizing species. We tell ourselves stories all the time as to why we just did what we did. If you look at what happens in markets, there will be the number of the day, some jobs report or whatever it might be. And people will say, whatever the market did today, it was because of this. It's really never because of the reason that they suggest. Especially if you look at how the exact same initiating event can be rationalized in different ways on one day or the next. If people are in an optimistic frame of mind, they will rationalize it one way. If they're in a pessimistic frame of mind, they rationalize it the other way. But it really is not the case that these events drive what markets do. Markets are driven by enormous swings of collective emotion, a continual tug of war between greed and fear. And so markets are a thermometer of social mood, collective social mood, which is fascinating because it happens almost in real time. And the shift from optimism to pessimism drives markets, it also drives the real economy, but it drives the market faster because the time frame is so short. It doesn't take long to buy or sell. It takes a lot longer to have an impact on the real economy for, for businesses to run out of orders, lay people off, go out of business. So I watch the markets because they're telling me what the mood is doing. They're telling me where the real economy will be in a few months' time. So I watch, I watch the markets turn the corner on May the 2nd and move into contraction again. The larger trend is now down. So I'm expecting a significant impact on the real economy coming over the next year or two. Because as the real economy plays catch up, that is what happens. It contracts. People suddenly become afraid. They don't take risks anymore. They lay people off because they're worried that they won't have enough orders. So you get the psychology of contraction taking hold in the real economy. And that leads to, to enormous falls, potentially, in, in GDP. But psychology is responsible for so much of it. Economics, the neoclassical economics, is a model that treats economies as if they were machines and run by the laws of physics. The assumption is that you can ignore people because people are messy and irrational. So you assume away the effects of people. But economies are made of people. If you take the people out, you don't have anything left. So this mechanistic view of how economies work is fundamentally wrong. Neoclassical economics would tell you that there's perfect information, perfect competition, rational utility maximization, efficient markets. Not one of those is an accurate reflection of reality. Markets are messy and irrational and emotionally driven. And people who say that markets are not predictable say that because they're using fundamentally the wrong model for understanding them. If you use the right model, they're far more predictable because 
they, they come from understanding human behavior at a collective level. If you view them that way, they are a far more effective, predictive tool for understanding the world than people would commonly have you believe. When I read financial news, I never take it at face value. I'm looking for the, the signals that the people who wrote these articles didn't even realize they were sending out. I'm looking for the emotional subtext of what they actually said, not the words. So I use, use financial journalism as a contrarian indicator. Financial journalism tells me what the herd is thinking, or more accurately, what the herd is feeling. Insiders make their money by doing the exact opposite of what the herd is doing at any given time. So when people are enormously optimistic, look for a trend change to the downside. When people are enormously pessimistic, this is how bottoms form. Because trend changes. When you have a trend, it takes a long time for a trend to become received wisdom, for everyone to start to believe in it. When you get to the point where almost everyone believes that things can only ever go up, they've already acted on that information. There's nobody left to take the trend any further. You've found your greatest fool, if you like. So things shift in the other direction. We look for trend changes at emotional extremes. And this is the same way when nobody wants something, when people say, in the depths of a depression, never buy stocks, they only ever go down, then they're cheap. It means that everyone has acted on that impression, sold everything. At that point, the insiders will be buying like crazy because that's where the opportunities are. So what the traders will say is buy when there's blood in the streets, which is not a nice metaphor to think about, but what they're saying is wait for maximum pessimism, and that's where the biggest opportunities lie. But the, the markets are played by insiders who understand herding behavior and are feeding off it all the time. Markets are a very predatory mechanism for separating ordinary people from their money. This is how they work all the time. The insiders have information, they understand how to interpret the sentiment signals, so that's where all the money is going. Ordinary people commit their money on a promise that they will make a lot of money in return, but mostly they don't. Mostly they stay far too long, so when things are going up, for instance, nobody wants to sell because they always think it'll go up more, and they don't want to miss out on, on gains, so they stay too long. Then the market falls, and they, they don't want to sell at first because they think, oh, then I'll be selling at a loss. So they, they try and hang on and hang on, but they end up losing everything in the end, and the insiders are just quite happily helping themselves to whatever is available to be taken. All of these wars are about oil, either about oil deposits or sometimes pipeline routes in the case of Afghanistan, for instance. But oil is liquid hegemonic power. The great powers know this. So what we're looking at is a replay of the great game, the geopolitical uh, interactions between the great powers over the resources that, that give them their ability to maintain power at a distance. So, for instance, if, if Hitler had had access to the oil of Azerbaijan, which is what he was trying to get by invading Russia, he might have won the Second World War. As it is, he didn't manage to secure those resources, so he was operating his tanks on coal to liquids, which is much less efficient, much lower net energy. The Allies had much higher net energy supplies. They were able to, that was a critical advantage in winning World War II. So access to the best energy supplies is always going to be critical to maintaining power. The great powers know this, so they are competing for access to those resources. What we've seen is an, a resource grab for the best supplies in terms of quantity, but especially net energy. So places like Iraq and Libya 
Well, Iraq has very large supplies. Libya has light, sweet crude with a very high net energy. These are obvious targets for control by, by the higher powers, by the, the, the large hegemonic powers. So yes, these wars are absolutely about oil. They're about securing not necessarily oil on the market, but securing military access to oil. For instance, in Iraq, what they have done is taken control of resources that could al allow the uh, people in control to use that as a military supply depot that would allow them to try and take control of energy resources in neighboring countries as well. So it's not that they wanted to take that oil and send it over to America so that people could go for Sunday drives in the afternoon. They wanted to control supplies close to where they might have to engage in future military adventures. There's another important geopolitical aspect to that, and that is Jeffrey Brown at the Oil Drum writes about the export land model. So what has been happening is in oil exporting countries, domestic demand has been rising. So when domestic demand rises, the amount available for export falls. There would come a point where all the energy produced in these countries would be consumed domestically. The great powers would not have access to it. So of course this is a problem from their point of view. Now, people who say that the Iraq war was a disaster from the point of view of America, I would say to them, it depends what you think they were trying to achieve. Personally, I think they were trying to wreck the competing domestic demand. Because if you can ruin the economy so that the domestic economy is not using as much, and you ruin the infrastructure so that you can't send it to other markets, then you establish complete control over those resources and how they are used. Personally, I think this was the goal of the Iraq War. From that perspective, it was spectacularly successful. And America has built the largest American embassy in the whole world in Baghdad. They're not leaving anytime soon. <laughs> They've established a beachhead there in the Middle East. This is the area that they wish to establish control over. There are many resource-producing areas where there will be enormous amounts of conflict. We, we've seen this in, in Libya recently. You know, we liked Muammar Gaddafi perfectly well when things were going well. We didn't have a problem with him as a dictator back then. All of a sudden we had a problem with him and we went in there, took him out and secured access to the oil supplies, or we are trying to. It's not completely established yet, but <laughs> geopolitics is so much about energy resources. When we move into an era of financial crisis, for a while we may see that diminish because for a while it will be money that's the limiting factor and people will be worried about what's going on in their domestic economy. For a while there may seem to be plenty of oil because our purchasing power will fall so fast that we won't be able to buy as much energy as we did and we won't have the economic activity that burns the energy to the same extent either. So in a period of depression, de well, demand falls a long way. Supply is geared to the previous level of demand. Temporarily, you have a glut or the perception of glut. So initially, financial crisis buys you time. It may diminish the geopolitical areas of conflict. In the longer term though, when you take the money out of the system, when you crash the money supply, you also take away investment in drilling, exploration, production, maintenance of infrastructure. So initially, financial crisis buys you time at the cost of making the situation dramatically worse later. So years of no investment in, in exploration or not even maintaining infrastructure means that you pretty much guarantee a supply crunch down the line. So then you go from money being the limiting factor to energy being the limiting factor again. And as the economy tries to recover, it hits a hard ceiling at a much lower level of energy than we currently have. So it's the complex interplay of energy and finance 
that determines how it plays out in practice. And when you get into supply crunch again, all of a sudden, all these resource grabs, resource wars will resume again as countries go back to trying to secure their supplies. And some countries do this by sending in tanks, others do it by sending in bilateral contract negotiators, for instance. This is what China does in Africa now. They simply buy up the production of whole oil fields in places like Nigeria and secure their supply that way. And importantly, they don't just take ownership, they don't just buy production, they establish de facto control. They send their people in to manage the resource and the assets as well. So this is a form of economic colonization of, of Africa by China, which is the empire in the ascendancy. But what they've done that's critically important is assumed actual control of these resources, not simply ownership, which means that when times get hard, the ownership is less likely to revert to the countries where the resources are. The, the uh, colonizers are more likely to be able to maintain control, maintain supply for themselves than they otherwise would be. So there are lots of complications with, with that as well, and that will get a lot worse in a few years when supply is much tighter than it is today. for where it's worth putting our efforts. When you have economic contraction, you also have a substantial contraction of the trust horizon. So what this does is it deprives political institutions at a national and international level of the trust that would give them political legitimacy. They become stranded assets from a trust perspective, which means people no longer internalize the rules that, that, that these institutions are attempting to impose. The response these institutions typically have is surveillance, coercion, and repression. Now, this picture basically suggests that it is pointless to look for solutions from the top down. It's not solutions that will come from the top down, it's more problems. So, politicians typically uh, make a bad situation worse as expensively as possible. And the systems that we have established have become sclerotic and unresponsive, hostage to vested interests. They have no ability to adapt quickly, to provide for changes that happen very rapidly, to, to give people abilities to, to cope. So I don't look for solutions from there. And the people who are part of that system are typically the people who have gained significant amounts from the status quo. These are the last people who are likely to change things. So I don't look for political actions. In, in many parts of, of the world, especially in parts of Europe, people always ask me about, well, we should take political action, shouldn't we? We should change our policies at the national level. And, and that will solve our problem. And, and I tell them, unfortunately not, because there really isn't any mechanism for these large bureaucratic institutions to offer anything that will realistically help. And in fact, what they're far more likely to do is try and maintain their own existence by sucking even more resources, money and um, access to other resources, out of the periphery in order to maintain the center. So this is a bit like when a body becomes hypothermic, so not enough heat. What happens is it shuts off the circulation to the fingers and toes in order to preserve the body temperature of the core. That's what we can expect to have to politicians to do, political systems to do. Unfortunately for us, we're the fingers and toes. We have to look after ourselves. Nothing is coming from the top down that's going to help us. So, my solutions, such as they are, and they're not solutions to the problem of financial crisis in the sense that they don't give you business as usual. That's no longer possible. But the solutions, such as they are, are grassroots solutions. So we need to build things from the bottom up. Our centralized life support systems are going to fail over time, not immediately, but over time, 
because they're critically dependent on tax revenues that won't be there and on cheap energy that won't be there either. So these centralized systems are not going to be able to deliver the goods and services that we rely on. What we need are alternatives. Those must come from the bottom up. Now, the reason that these work is because they work within the trust horizon. The trust horizon has contracted. The things that still, that still operate within where trust exists still can operate really quite well. They don't have to stay small. It depends. They can grow to whatever size the trust will support. And that may be completely different in different places. But the critical thing is they come from the bottom up, they're small, they're not bureaucratic, they're responsive, they make the best use of very small amounts of resources because there's no enormous administrative overhead. It is amazing what can be done at a very small scale. It wouldn't replace what the centralized services have given us. So it's not like we can have everything that the centralized services gave us but we can cover the basics. The key point is we have to do it right now because we don't have a lot of time before we start to see centralized systems failing to deliver what they have delivered in the past. The amount of money in the system can contract very quickly. That undercuts what these centralized systems are capable of delivering over the next few years. So we must start right now building grassroots initiatives and community is so important to that. It's, it really is the strongest approach. We do need to do things at an individual level because we have to have our solid foundation. If we, if we are on a solid foundation ourselves, we can then help others. If we are not, then our attempt to help others is fundamentally weakened. So we have to get our own house in order, but then we have to think much more broadly than that. We must build community. Relationships of trust are the foundation of society. So we need to work with our neighbors. We need to know our neighbors. We need connections with family and community so that we're less dependent on money. In many parts of the world where people really don't have any money anyway and have never had any money, their societies entirely function on barter and gifts working together, exchange of skills. This works as a model. It's, it's not, it doesn't get you a, a large, fancy, sophisticated industrial society. It doesn't scale up that well. But it works very well at a small scale. And it's this kind of structure that we need to rebuild. Now, in some parts of the world, there's a lot more of that than in other parts. So it's actually interesting to think that it's not necessarily the places that are the wealthiest at the moment that will do best in the future. The analogy that I use is if you're going to fall out of a window, how much it hurts when you hit the ground depends on how many floors up you were at the time. So if you were on the hundredth floor and you did nothing to prepare, put a parachute on perhaps, if you do nothing to prepare before you fall out the window, it's going to be fatal. If you're much further down, it's much less painful. If you fell out of the ground floor window, you might not even notice. You just pick yourself up, dust yourself up, and not very much has changed. So I think the places that will do best are the places where there is a lot of already the, the trust at the foundational level, at the community level, where people are used to working together, where people are not that far removed, perhaps in terms of connection with the land, places where there's an enormous disconnect between what is possible in that area, the resources of, of, of that area, and what resources are actually used, and where societies are very atomized and very used to living on at a high material standard of living, those places, there's going to be an enormous shock to the system because people don't have any skills or connections with land or family to fall back on. So it's very important to look at, at those connections. We can work on rebuilding them in areas where they've been lost, but some areas have an advantage because those systems still exist.
So a lot of the, the parts of Europe that are more peripheral, for instance, still have that connection with the land. So they may actually do a lot better in the future. They also often have a substantial thriving informal economy that is likely to be far more resilient as well. So all of that will be important. Now, for making the move from where we are to where we are going, things like transition towns are an important movement. Transition towns is about planning now for a lower energy, lower access to money society that has less of an impact on the environment. So the critical point is that we are making the plans now while we still have the luxury of the long term. Because when all of a sudden there's nothing, when there's not much to go around and people are worried about where their next meal is coming from or their next paycheck, their time horizon is this long. They lose the luxury of the long term then they're in a state of short-term crisis management. You can't plan, you can't think of even next week maybe, let alone next year or further down the line. So if we make our, and, and try to implement those plans for energy descent in particular, now, while we still have the luxury of the long term, that can be enormously important. It gets the ball rolling. And the greater the extent to which we can preserve a cushion, the greater the extent to which we can preserve the luxury of the long-term view in the future. This is one reason it's very important to prepare particularly for the financial aspect of the crisis because if we don't, if we lose our freedom of action, liquidity is freedom of action, it's, it's choices, unmade choices, that's what cash actually is. If we can preserve liquidity while we still can, then we have a cushion that allows us to maintain that longer term view, allows us to maintain the freedom of action. And what it does, especially if we can maintain that liquidity in the hands of ordinary people, it means that we put the financial resources in the hands of the people best positioned to build the community initiatives that are the solution. So we need to keep as much as we can at the base of the pyramid. So in trying to do this, we're fighting the tendency to centralize everything, the tendency to keep everything at the center and cut off the circulation to the fingers and toes. The fingers and toes are, are fighting back, if you like. Not fighting in a physical sense, but to attempting to keep control over enough resources at the base of the pyramid to allow us to fund the initiatives that can make the biggest difference. So we, we keep the freedom of action, the liquidity in the hands of the people who are best positioned to make a difference, and then we can, we can build a different kind of future. In many ways, Italy is the future. Yes, the political system is completely corrupt, in other places where it's not yet so corrupt, the chances are that politics will go the same way as it has in Italy. There's a risk that it could go that way. Not the same extent in all places, but all national political institutions in other countries are going to have a hard time um, being able to function when they become stranded assets. So I think the political system in Italy it, it's parasitic, it's completely corrupt. And I would say ignore the politicians completely because to do anything else only encourages them. So I just ignore the political system, focus on the grassroots where the differences can actually be made. And the interesting advantages that Italy has is really lie at the grassroots. Well, they lie in the fact that already nobody is looking for solutions from the top down. They've written off politicians as being sources of solutions but also they are more able to look after themselves, not equally everywhere in Italy, but in a lot of places where there are strong community and family ties, people are already used to looking after themselves to a greater extent because they've always had to. They know how to live like that. Other parts of the world, that isn't true. In many parts of the world, families are spread at great distance. People don't know their neighbors civic engagement has disintegrated. Civil society it has really fallen apart in many ways. People don't 
come out and work together in the way that they used to. So in places where people still do that, that's a tremendous advantage. So Italy has more of that than many, many other places do. And there's a lot that can be built on. I think if we try and build on that foundation that already exists with slightly more formal mechanisms like time bags, for instance, or local currencies, which I realize are currently illegal, but eventually people will simply do what they have to do. And we will see other forms of uh, transactions, means of, of, uh, of accounting for transactions will naturally emerge, and they will have to. We can build on all of these mechanisms of coming together, and this helps to scale up the, the connections that already exist in the grassroots. So you have to try and extend trust further than it currently lies. And by using things like time banking or, or local currencies, that is a mechanism for doing that. And anything that people come together to do, whether it's community gardens or time banking or anything else, anything people come together to do will build social capital. And this builds on relationships of trust. So all of these things are very much a part of a solution in the sense of giving us the best possible outcome. It won't look like business as usual, but nothing will look, nothing we can possibly do will give us business as usual. All we can do is try and, and get through this as best we possibly can with the least pain for the, the greatest number of people. So all of these initiatives that come from the ground up are the best, the best hope we have of building a different future. And in places like Italy, where the foundation already exists to a much greater extent than in many other places, that is going to be a critical advantage. We cannot continue to consume what we consume now. It will be physically impossible no matter what we do. I think the most critical thing is to reduce our dependency on cheap energy. So, there are many things that we can do while we still have money, for instance. There are many things we can do to reduce our future need for energy supply. So things like home insulation, for instance, are critical. Or having extremely energy efficient appliances, or perhaps not having an appliance to do the work for you at all and doing it more with human energy. There are many, many ways of reducing our demand. And when we reduce our dependency, we reduce our vulnerability. So I think reducing demand is, is number one. We may then attempt to supply some of what demand is left. So for instance, we might put solar panels on our own roof or, or on a municipal building even if we're trying to, to supply something more than just a, something private. We can attempt to supply some of the demand that's left. That will also reduce our dependency. But we have to be very careful not to take on debt to do it. Because if people borrow a lot of money to put in infrastructure, chances are that will simply be repossessed and will end up being owned by somebody else in the future. So if you take on debt to do it, it really is no solution. But it is going to be very difficult. I, I think we are inevitably going to have vastly less energy than we currently do, whatever form that energy may be in. Some people might be considerably luckier than others. Certainly people who happen to live in a small town with a hydro plant, for instance, will have local power. Many other places will probably have very little. So there will be big differences between different places, sometimes to do with energy, but also to do with access to all sorts of other resources. And I think simply the main message is to reduce dependency on the need for large supplies of inputs. So the more we can produce for ourselves and the less we actually need, the better off we are. I would say for the vast majority of people, it will be on balance unhappy because people are very wedded to a materialistic lifestyle. They like the life they have now. They like to be able to flick a switch and have the lights come on or, or 
have gas to heat their home whenever they want it. They like being able to go out and buy an iPad. When they can't do these things anymore, they're not going to like it. So there's going to be an, an adjustment period inevitably. And a lot of this is psychological. When people have expectations that are up here somewhere, and all of a sudden reality is down here, that's a recipe for, well, a lot of social disorder, a lot of disappointment. Dashed expectations are dangerous. It really, we need to get our expectations in line with reality. And it's a lot better to do that in advance than wait until you're forced into a situation where you're simply deprived. If you psychologically prepare for a much lower material standard of living in advance, then it doesn't have to be anywhere near as painful. But we're back to psychology again. That's very, very important. Now, I think the whole transition has a, a good side as well, because essentially our period of manic growth and expansion has been incredibly destructive as well destructive of natural capital, destructive of human relationships and community, and a lot of things that made life possible and made life worth living. So we have lost a lot in building the world that we have built. And I think the transition that we're going to make, while it will be painful in the sense of taking a giant step back in terms of material standard of living, I think it will in many ways allow us to rediscover what it means to be human, to get away from an obsession with earning and the rat race and the constant treadmill that goes faster and faster, and get back to a kind of lifestyle where we know our neighbors, we work together, inevitably a smaller scale lifestyle and less materialistic, but there will be many things we rediscover that are part of what makes human beings truly happy. Now the flip side of that is when you contract and you end up at a smaller scale, also part of what it means to be human is uh, fighting over losses when, when there's not enough to go around. You tend to get, you get inter-tribal or intergroup trust, intra or intra-group trust, inter-group distrust. So you can tend to get tribalism and conflict between groups. And unfortunately, that's also part of what it means to be human. So there's a good and a bad side. We may rebuild wonderful communities that make us happy, but we may then find that we don't like those people over there very much anymore because they're competitors for resources, for instance. So there is an unfortunate side to contraction as well. And being human has two sides, and we, we're going to discover both of them. Basically, without energy, much of our technology is funny-shaped sculptures that don't do anything. So, we have a tremendous dependence on technology that is, un un in an underlying way, a tremendous dependence on the energy that, that enables it to continue to exist. So, we have to maintain all the infrastructure that allows us to use things like the, the internet that is dependent on money as well as energy. And there's, there's this sense that things don't have to last because we, can all, we buy a new one every couple of years anyway. So things are not built to last. Computers won't last more than a few years before the hard drives get poisoned, the silicon chips cease to, uh, to, to be able to process information, you get contamination in the hard drives. You also have had, in recent years, uh, the replacement of the material used to make the, the electrical connections within uh, computers and iPads and things like that. The reason that they replaced the compound is that during taking these apart, it was environmentally unfriendly. But what they did is replace the solder with tin. Tin grows whiskers over time. It's unstable. What, means, what that means is that it will short out the components of your, electrical, your electronic systems. So these are not built to last. When we can no longer afford to replace them, the ones we have will only last a certain amount of time. So the devices don't last forever. We can't afford to replace them. The infrastructure depends on, on the money. 
what we have as the internet today depends on people being able to pay for internet access, being able to pay hosting fees if they run a website, and also on governments maintaining net neutrality, maintaining access, general access to, to the web for taking information from it and putting information onto it. I think all three of those things are, are under threat. If people don't have money, fewer people will be able to afford internet access, fewer people will be able to pay to host information, to put information out there, and governments are very likely to decide that certain websites are a threat and shut them down. We've seen this in many parts of the world already. So I think the kind of information that is out there will be much less useful. There will be less of the important information and more propaganda, for instance, than there is now. So I tell people, right now, there's an unbelievable treasure trove of information out there. Download it <laughs> while you can. Don't just store it electronically, either. Find ways to store it where you're still going to have access to it when your computer doesn't work anymore, when your flash drive doesn't work anymore. So we have to think of ways of preserving information and knowledge. That's going to be critically important. We have put all our knowledge preservation into electronic forms that are unstable, that have a built-in failure mechanism. If we don't find other ways to store that knowledge, we risk losing it. <coughs> so th there's, there's a tremendous risk in our reliance on technology that we really don't understand the full scope of. I think we need to start thinking of appropriate technology. What are the most important means of, say, leveraging human effort to enable us to do the things that genuinely matter? So it may be more important to have a really good hoe than a tractor, because a tractor depends on spare parts you might not be able to get and fuel you might not be able to get, whereas a really good hoe depends on a sharpener and your muscles and your food for powering it. So there are all sorts of things, tools that can make a huge difference, but they're very simple technology. A lot of our very complex technology I think probably will not survive over the next several decades and the, the risk is a lot of knowledge will be lost and that can have significant implications. For instance, will anyone remember how to decommission a nuclear power plant in a few decades time? I am not convinced that they will. So we are building risks with our technology that we may not be able to address in the future as well. So the impact of our technology could be profoundly negative in many ways in a simpler future. It's basically a, a rise of anger against the current system. I mean, Five Star is exactly the same. People are just completely fed up with the corruption, all the, the money being given to bailout insiders at the same time as the weakest members of society are having their benefits cut. And, Life is getting harder and harder for the little people. And they're, what they're watching is all their tax money being given to bail out a banking system that is what got us into this situation in the first place, at least the financial component of it. The very people who made irresponsible bets and have now incurred enormous losses are being given the money so that they don't have to bear those losses. The broader society is being forced to bear the losses. People are very angry about this. So movements of anger and fear are actually going to spread like wildfire. So when they reach critical mass, this becomes very dangerous. We have to be very careful. When we protest, when we try to change the status quo, we have to be very careful that we don't go overboard and just put all our energy into blaming other people, trying to find people to blame and punishing them. The real risk is if all our energy and emotional intensity becomes devoted to, to negative things, to, to blame and punishment, we're not going to be focusing on the things that genuinely make a difference. So these movements,
They may start with the best of intentions, but they are a double-edged sword. There are risks there, because the risk is that people who are angry and afraid can be easily manipulated by demagogues, for instance, that can then shift that movement, give it a focus on maybe immigrants, for instance, or anyone else who might be a popular target, or bankers or politicians, some of whom might actually deserve it, but, but many of whom wouldn't. But nevertheless, playing the blame game is pointless. We need to maintain our focus on the constructive things that we can do. So one of the things that I talk about is a kind of psychological inoculation. So I explain to people that movements of anger and fear will spread like wildfire. There are risks associated with this. It will be very easy to be caught up in it because anger and fear are so catchy. But if we, if we allow ourselves to be caught up in it, that may simply take all our energy and resources. So if, on the other hand, we see this for what it is, because it's a movement of human hurting behavior, if we see it for what it is, it's easier to avoid being drawn into movements that are negative. I think we need to maintain our focus on, on the constructive positive things, and if we, if we understand where human herding behavior can take us in contractionary conditions and refuse to go along with that, then that, that sets us up for being able to maintain our focus on the important things.